You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and I am accompanied by Jared Mount from Jake's Bait and Tackle. Uh, We're doing another uh, remote stream this evening. And today we have a really cool guest. We have Alex Fioki. Did I say that correctly? Fioka. Alex yep. Fioka. So, guys, this is why we prep beforehand because I would still botch it even after saying it in my head a thousand times. Uh, he was the winner of the 2022 Potomac River Trail Two Championship on, on with the KBS series, and I guess it's the Real Tree KBS series. And also, you won the Envy KBA uh, tournament as well because they were combined with a total of 92.5 inches which is incredible because I had no idea what kind of length and or weight was going to take to win that weekend. I had people fishing boat tournaments that were saying like, it's probably going to only take 15 pounds to win. I heard some of my kayak anglers I talked to say like, man, it's going to be tough, but dude, you freaking just smoked them that weekend. Thank you. Yeah, it was, it was a good weekend. It was good. It was good fishing. I like fishing in the spring. So, <laughs> so, so Alex, tell us a little bit like, how did you get into kayak fishing? Uh, well, I guess rolling back to 2016, I'd recently gotten out of the military and I had a boat at the time and I ended up just kind of selling the boat because a boat's a really good tool for everybody to jump on. You basically are their fishing guide, take them out fishing, uh, drive, come back home or, you know, drop them off, come home. You have to clean all your stuff, fill it with gas. And then you're like, ah, this is many fun. Um, and I saw that, you know, kayak bass fishing was really kind of starting to gained some serious momentum back then you know it's kind of like what what's it going to hurt to try you know and it was like Mm -hmm. i i love a good challenge and the learning curve and everything and i truth be told i jumped in head first and sold the boat and i've been here ever since so that's freaking awesome what 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 type of uh, setup are you running uh currently i'm in a uh hobie pro angler 12 foot uh with a 360 degree drive Okay. Okay. And yeah, I've that... I've got that powered by uh, a Torquedo 403 AC motor on the tournaments that you're allowed to use motors. Now, with 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 that kayak setup, what kind of range do you actually have with that Torquedo? I mean, are you are you still putting in? Let's say if you're going to be fishing Madawoman and you want to go to Belmont Bay, are you are you making that run across, or are you still like hopping uh, from boat ramp to boat ramp? Uh, I think for the most part, you would want to still use your boat ramps to your advantage. Um, but on a pre-fishing day, you know, where nothing's really on the line, I can mm-hmm. cover the length of Madawoman twice fully throughout the day um, if I'm if I'm gentle on the motor. Um, during tournament time, you know, generally I'm ready to go somewhere. I, I run it as fast as I can, and naturally mm-hmm. that's harder on a battery, but uh, realistically with my motor, if I want to run somewhere in the three mile an hour range, you're looking at somewhere around 20 miles. Um, That's and my good. motor, wow. yeah, my motor tops out at uh, 5.2, 5.3, depending on what I have in the kayak that day. And, uh, if I run it at a hundred percent, the numbers are, are drastically much less than that. I would say closer to nine, nine and a half, somewhere in that range running at a hundred percent, but that's freaking awesome are yeah you, it, do you find that you're like are you fishing around a lot of other kayakers or like because it, it's it's a broad range obviously so uh do you see that a lot where you guys are on top of each other or you guys spread out a good bit you know it's kind of interesting because it, it all depends on the body of water um i recently fished yeah, so this year i've been down to the Kissimmee, uh hmm. chain wow um been in South Carolina twice. Um, and then, you know, running a trail up here, it it all depends on the body of water. Um, anytime that you fish the Potomac river in the springtime, I think you're going to be keyed up on, you're going to be around other boats, no matter what. And that's boats and kayaks. (laughs) Um, because let's face it, these fish are relating to one thing and one thing only this time of year. Uh, Well, two. Um, but it's, it, it, it's, it's really concentrated areas. And I, you know, I, I think I'd be doing everyone a disservice to say that it's not common to have a place on, you know, the Potomac river to yourself this time of year. It's Mm -hmm. just really not. And that goes for boats and kayaks. Um, but typically on a bigger body of water, um, 
I like to try and get away from the crowd. I'm not afraid of making a long run just to get away from it. Sometimes it pays off. Sometimes mm -hmm. it doesn't. I mean, some, sometimes tournaments are won within 200 yards of a boat ramp that you launch from. So right. yeah, the fish don't know there's a boat ramp there. So <laughs> yeah, it, it's, I was told once when I, when I was play, fishing high school, like the Potomac is one of the biggest places that fish is the smallest that you'll ever really go to. Is. And it, really it, is. I didn't really understand that until I got older, but like, so, so going into the tournament, like how much practice did you have going into this? Were you going based off of history? Was this just a blank slate? I mean, like, like I really wanted to get to the thought process before day one. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, so my game plan was to cover as much water as feasibly possible. Um, and, and I did, um, I started down in Aquia Creek, um, and this is the weekend before, and I kind of got to a few spots and it was like, Oh, no grass yet, you know, time to move on. Mm -hmm. So I didn't waste a ton of time down there. I was just like, uh, you know, let's see if I can go find some grass somewhere else. And then it was mm -hmm. like Piscataway, Mattawoman. And historically speaking, I think right now the vegetation level is behind uh i think that we've had an incredibly cold spring um and i don't think that the grass is where it usually is and i know that differentiates from year to year on spots and locations on the potomac where sometimes belmont bay will start firing off before aquia will um but i've always just kind of known it you know the, the dogwood blooming is like mm -hmm. that's your time to start looking for newly emergent grass um, and if you can find that, you're going to find fish um, and, and usually good numbers of them. And I, I think that was kind of the case with uh, the, that trail that weekend. However, I, I didn't really find grass, but I found, you know, some uh, lily pad stems that were a little bit further along than others and mm -hmm. also had a little wood mixed in there. So I think it was just kind of like the perfect storm for those fish. What was your water temperature? Um, Saturday, I think the highest I saw was 56, somewhere in there. And then Sunday dropped down a little bit um, because it was a really, it was a, it was kind of a cooler night that night, if I remember correctly. And, and I want to say I started in like the low fifties and it didn't climb much hmm. um, on Sunday. Uh, what I was, was your water temperature get, the weekend before? It was, it was about the same. Um, same yeah you know we got some rain in between and the you know when i fished aquia i saw rain on the forecast and i thought you know maybe some warm rain might really kind of jump start things and then it turned out to be cold rain with wind because mm -hmm. we can't get away from wind this time of year right and i just think it was just kind of like another non-warming trend week mm -hmm. so um but it didn't matter on sunday I found them and I found all of them on Sunday. So, uh, wow. And, and, you know, I, I, it was the area that I made my first cast in. And this is also an area that I tried on Saturday and I just couldn't get it to kick off like, you know, I thought it would. But, um, was it a timing it, deal in practice to be able to get because between the two days? Yeah. So here's the other thing too is it's really tough, um, pre fishing a week beforehand on the tidal Potomac because mm -hmm. your tide cycles doing almost exactly opposite of what it's going mm -hmm. to be doing. Yeah. You're just looking for bites. For me, I'm just looking for bites. You know, if I can catch them, you know, get a few bites in an area. I don't think this time of year they're going far. They might start, you know, staging mm -hmm. up a little bit further, but you've got a solid starting point from there. It narrows down your, your target area. Um, Matawoman Creek is the closest creek to where I live, so it's generally one I spend a lot more time in. Yeah. Um, I've had just as much success down in Aquia and some of those Virginia creeks, but where I live, I've either got to go north to go south or south to go north, you know, because I've got two bridges <laughs> that I've got to use to get over there. So, and, and you know, that's something too, Tom, as you bring up that in our my circles, we've been talking like you know about talking about practice and things like that, and you and even watching the elite guys and. And how some of them talk about, you know, you can practice all you want, but the day of is, is going to set up totally different. And so mm -hmm. you know, it's not to say you shouldn't practice, but good for you, too, to go back to an area that maybe didn't produce in practice because it, it inevitably no two days are the same or alike. And so you got to no. be willing to adjust or adapt or you, you can, like I say, you can practice. And I think 
listening to you too, just kind of even knowing where the grass is and kind of what, you know, certain features that you're looking for to fish uh, is as important as, uh, or more important than even finding the fish maybe. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't care what people say, grass is king on this place. And we all know that there's only like five creeks that, you know, are the juice where they're going to routinely get big limits. So I, I do agree with the idea. Like, are you going to actually have a place all yourself? Not really. I mean, even when the pros come here, no one really wins a four day event off a place that they have completely to themselves. It's generally, you just figured out something a little bit differently. And, right. and like, like Jerry, like you said, like practicing on title is a completely different animal. That's why when you watch the opens or, or even the big kayak events, it's always dudes that have that like that 10 to 15 year experience or, or a decent amount of experience of history on title that they know because it is hard to pre-fish for it ahead of time. If the tide mm -hmm. cycles aren't right, you're, you're screwed mm -hmm. because you're not going to understand how that place sets up at that time compared mm -hmm. to a, like, like let's say a lake. Now, and, and with with that said, like generally speaking, do you like to to camp or do you like to milk run when you're dealing with tides? Just generally speaking. It's. Fishing boat tournaments, I love chasing tide. Um, but when you're on a kayak, you're, yeah, your your right. ability to creek hop, you know, and stay on that that cusp of that tide cycle, you know, the chasing mm -hmm. tides, quote unquote, is is tough. And and I don't know if it. Now I will say that if I want to make my move, you know, let's say uh, low tide hits at like nine o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. I'll make my move on a kayak, which is a, takes a lot longer um, during that dead tide. Uh, just because I know that it, you can get bit um, during a, a, you know, when the tide is stopped, a slack tide period. Um, but I've generally found that if I, that's the time I want to waste. Um, okay. Because if I can start kicking off that, you know, if it's outgoing till nine, you know, that 10 o'clock, 10, 15, 10, 30, I want to be in that spot for when that starts to, mm -hmm. you know, move back in. And, and I want to be in the position to where, you know, I'm not wasting time during those key moments of that tide cycle. And, and, you know, that's a really cool part about guys coming in from uh, all over the country to fish these events that have never touched tidal water. And it was really impressive to watch some of them pick it up. Like they just get it, you know, hmm. and, and, and they found good areas and they really, really did well. And uh, the local competition for me, I mean, it's, it's crazy. I mean, NVKBA has got some of the best tidal water fishermen. Um, you know, they've got guys that can just show up and win a tournament on the Potomac any given Sunday. So just to kind of, you know, be there with them and, 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 you know, have that, that little bit of like a, Oh yeah, well I'll shake with them too. You know, that buffers is good. Mm -hmm. So. So then getting into it, like, okay, Friday, Friday, you basically, you find what you think is acceptable. Like you're going to pr probably do well. Um, and with that said, are you looking for like three bites, two bites, 10 bites? What, what to getting into this tournament? Are you, what amount of bites are you looking for to where you're like, all right, I think this area is going to, going to be the one. Um, so I knew that the spot that I was going to first thing Saturday morning, um, should have at least three to five fish. Um, Saturday morning came around and I got there, you know, and I was feeling pretty good about it. And then lines in happened and it was the boat parade came down from, yep. uh, you know, Smallwood. And I'm sitting there like, they don't see me, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> they did. And they all came into it because I knew it was good. I was going to have, I was really hoping to try and, you know, kind of back to back, get a, get a couple on the board, you know, at least pick off the easy ones and then I can slow down. Um, but every time I start a tournament, I don't have a desired number of bites less than what it takes to win a tournament or to complete a limit of a tournament, which is five. Um, okay. I don't start breathing until I have five and they may be five, 12 inch fish, but five, 12 inch fish is better than two 20 inch fish. Uh, so, so when you're looking for a spot in practice, you're like, if I don't get five bites here, you don't think this is going to be the spot. You're at least looking for five before you commit to an area. No, in practice, I'm realistically trying my best not to get bit, you know, oh, I'll okay. maybe set the hook on one or two just to kind of see what we're dealing with size wise. But after that, I've kind of got a unique way of, uh, bending a hook in. So it's really hard for a fish to actually, you know, 
Um, or, you know, come later on in topwater season, I, I can take the hooks right off of a whopper plopper and flick it around and mm-hmm. they can hit at it all they want or something along those lines. Um, and just to see what I'm generating for strikes, I've found that fish that don't get hooked are fish that are willing to bite another, you know, day or two later. So That is a pro tip there. How many guys, especially like high schoolers we talk to that are trying to just yank, you know, 20 pounds on the Friday before an event. And it's just like, it is a real pro to be like, you know, I'm going to sacrifice this day of maybe, ca- you know, catching some nice ones, but I just want to see what's there. And that takes really good discipline to do that. It's something that I've learned probably way too late in life because I've done myself disservice by going in and it's, it's really hard to not set the hook on a fish. You know, you're like, ooh, 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 ooh. yeah, you know, and then you open the bail or whatever and you're kind of like, you know, just get off of here. <laughs> um, and you know, it's easier to do that when you're somewhere, you know, um, I, I feel like I've got a lot of experience compared to some on the Potomac river. So generally mm-hmm. if I can generate a bite or two, I know I can pretty much leave it alone and know I can go back there the next day and pick off a few. Um, but then the Potomac's got this little like uh, vendetta against everybody that you can go and get those bites, you know, and go back the next day and be like, what happened? What mm-hmm. happened here? You know, like, or, or day two of the event, you can go back to where you were like, I, I stopped fishing yesterday because I wanted a few mm-hmm. more for today. And then something happened. You know, you left them biting and you go back and you've got all this confidence. And then you're like an hour into the tournament, you don't even have a bite yet. And you're like, "Uh oh, so I think the more important aspect for my pre-fishing is to always try and at least give myself. Sometimes it's hard to get three options on a kayak. If I can come up with two really good options, I take that Mm. over three Um, so-sos. And I like to park on a spot. Um, I, I don't like moving a ton um especially because you know uh, without giving away too much there's certain areas on the potomac Mm -hmm. river where you can go and you know you're surrounded by a bunch of boats and then you'll notice like one guy over there catches one and then all of a sudden like everybody kind of started catching them and all of a sudden you've got one now and it's like you've got to make hey like get get that fish in the line get it measured put it back in there and then, you know, this goes on for 15 or 20 minutes and all of a sudden, done. nobody's catching again. And then that That's, wave yeah. comes in and it starts. So I'm okay with, I don't get too spun out over a period of not catching a fish. Um, I just does, does my, my confidence a ton of good knowing that they're there, you know, a bite mm-hmm. or two here and there. Mm-hmm. Um, that's hard so, too. That's a great way of looking at it though. If you see people f- catching fish around you, instead of getting spun out, look at it as a positive. Like, oh, they're here. Right. Like that. That's a really interesting way of looking at that. And I know I sidetracked us from your tournament, but um. Oh no. So it's, anyway, it's all good. Yeah. But yeah, so there's 300 boats blazing right past you from from Smallwood, and so this is day one. It also rained as much enough to uh, like float Noah's Ark that week too. So <laughs> yeah, it was- that all happened. The good news is, though, is down south, I can't speak for some of the creeks up north, but the mud didn't show up till after the tournament on Sunday. I mean, it, the, the water dinged up a little bit. I'm not saying that, but that that fall line mud from uh, the Great Falls area that, you know, kind of slowly trickles its way and branches out into the creeks with all the debris. I really didn't see a whole of that. So thankfully, um, that held off for the time because that would have inevitably changed probably everyone's game on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so boats, boats come rolling in and, you know, pretty soon I've been, I'm in the mix and you'll find that on the Potomac, what you think is yours certainly becomes someone else's. And there's an element of, there's a little bit of bullying that goes on between everybody out there, you know, Mm. you know, you just try and be sly and sneak your way in there. And then pretty soon you kind of like let the tide carry over and then it pushes that guy over. And I got a little spun out with that. Um, I'm not going to lie. You know, I had caught a fish and it, there's a process. I was in the depth of water that I was in was a little too deep to drop my power pole. Um, and I'm trying to maintain my position cause I'm keying in on some real key wood and, uh, the tides shifting me away, shifted me away, but I'm, I've got to take a picture of this fish. Cause I can't cast back in until this fish is photographed and it is out of my possession. Um, and sometimes getting those fish to cooperate 
is it's it's a little daunting and then you've got your nerves going too and so i kind of float away and a boat sneaks in and kind of gets my spot and i kind of mm. sit there and i'm working a little bit down from where i want to be and i start to see them you know catch one and i'm like oh i was like okay cool i gotta get out of here and i had a you know that plan b and i and i go to my plan b spot and there's at this what point time I'm looking, is this? uh probably about 9 30. It, it's, 9 30 got one yeah all oh, right have, i have two at this point oh um, okay 9 30 yeah, so i've got i've got two at this point and then um i go to my secondary spot which is i'm gonna say every bit of a mile okay that's not bad no but i turned the corner and there's i counted 11 boats oh and i was God. like man and i you know fished around there for a little bit i ended up scrapping out one other fish and i said all right i'm packing things up now i've got to make a call it's like 11 somewhere in the 10th or 11 it's like i've got to i've got to go to my plan c which is a different creek so i load my stuff up real quick hop in the truck and get to this second creek that i'm fishing and the wind is blowing right in at this point kind of right where mm. i'm at um, and I picked one up relatively quick there. Um, but the wind just really kind of made it tough. And I wasn't, I didn't have the best of luck. The, the, the shoreline that I wanted to fish that I had caught some fish pre-fishing was really getting hammered hard. And I didn't think, I wasn't getting big bites in this spot, but I was getting, I was generating a lot of little bites. Mm -hmm. And I, I just don't think that those little fish wanted to deal with that. And I don't, you know, normally I'd love to see a windblown bank um, because I know that, you know, those it's pushing bait up in there. It's mixing things up and it's an easy meal. But I just don't think that I had the the quality of fish that were willing to hang around. And uh, I just left the day a little bit short after that. Mentally, how are you feeling at this point? Like, like you get, I mean, like you Plan A is doing well to begin with. You get two, then you get somebody that hops your spot. You turn the corner and then it's like, good Lord, there's 11 boats there. I'm assuming there's a couple of kayaks too. And then you go to your plan C, like, like what was your mentally, what were you thinking going into day two at this point? Um, I, I, I got a, you know, I, I fished up to the bell Saturday and on my way back home, I stopped my, I, I had just made my son's hockey practice. Um, so I was able to like pull in with a kayak on the trailer <laughs> at his hockey arena and I was able to watch him practice hockey and that was good. So that was like a mental reset. Didn't think about fishing. Um, and I got home and I was really tired and I, I passed out on the couch and I woke up a couple hours later and I felt like tar. I, I, I did. I mean, it, probably a little bit mixed in with a, didn't do so hot, didn't do as well as I thought on Saturday. And I, I just kind of felt nauseous, tired. So I said, the heck with it. I'm going to go to bed and just have a different day tomorrow. And uh, I, I set my alarm for like 3.30 and I, I woke up and I, I got out of bed and I was like vertigo. I, I like, wow. and then it hit me. I was like, I didn't drink any water yesterday. And I oh, didn't, no. you know, and I'm like, rookie mistake not to drink. But, you know, I was, I was a little bit beside myself after kind of how things transpired. And I guess that's where it left me. And I, I went back to bed. I was like, you know what? My body is telling me I need something other than fishing right now. Um, and I went back to bed and I woke up at 630 and felt quite a bit better. And I said, you know, I'm going to go out there and just have fun today. You know, go back to those spots. I don't think there was going to be the boats. Um, ended up drinking coffee with my wife. Uh, but you know, it's like lunch times five thirty a.m. Here it is six thirty. Me and her at the counter mm -hmm. drinking coffee, Kidding. and I'm like, "That's I'm awesome." Not, I haven't even left the house yet. <laughs> and then she's That's like, great. "Are you gonna go fishing?" I was like, "Yeah, at some point." And she's like, "You should probably go." <laughs> That's classic. Yeah, that is freaking so, awesome. That's going to be in my artillery now. I'm gonna just going to have one of those like, <laughs> oh, "I'll get there when I get there" kind of thing. And uh, now made it down there eight o'clock. <laughs> took took my time launching. And uh, you can do a bass yeah. university on this strategy, guys. I, I love it. I love it too. Because I always <laughs> think about it in these other bass tournaments, like for the lunch, like going up to the restaurant, you know, stopping for lunch, you know, yeah. up, 
grabbing yeah. a burger and a beer and then like getting back out on the bite or something. So yeah, no, so it, cool. it was kind of cool how it worked out. So, Sunday I launch at eight and I'm like, all right, let's just go back. Let's see what happens. <laughs> That's cool. And so you start with eight plan A, B, C was kind of your thing. Same rotation. Yeah, pretty much. So that was my plan. My plan changed. I'm heading to plan A and there's someone sitting there and I was like, mm. good for them because I wasn't there when I should have been. So I went immediately to plan B, which is a spot yet that Saturday didn't produce a fish, but I know historically there's fish around there. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm like on the motor still, you know, and I crank off the motor and I, I, I just fire in a quick cast, you know, I'm passing by. I'm like, what's it going to hurt to just put something in the water? Cause you don't, you don't catch fish. It is a fact. You don't catch fish if you don't have a lure in the water. <laughs> Fact. Um, and right away caught one. Uh, and it was a decent fish. I don't think it was, any, it was definitely a fish that I had called later. So we're, we're at like what, probably eight fifteen right now in the morning. Um, I measure that fish, submit it, toss it back. And I fire another cast in and it's like 18. And I was like, done. We're parking it. We're not moving boys. You know? And I think I could be a liar, but I want to say by 10 o'clock, I had 90 inches already. Damn. Um, wow. And That's freaking awesome. Uh, there was a guy nearby and I looked at him and I said, you know, I kind of, we were, you know, there's always small talk on the river just between everybody. Mm -hmm. I was telling him, yeah, I didn't get out here till you know, drinking coffee with my wife. <laughs> and then I said, if I catch one more upgrade, I'm leaving here and I'm going home and having lunch with her. <laughs> <laughs> And the, the upgrade took me a while, but I was really running through a, a good class of fish. But, you know, it's tough to start culling when your your small fish is in that, you know, 17 and a half inch range. And uh, But there's another example, too, where like your plan didn't work, but you just rolled with it. And, and the secondary plan ended up working out. And I've seen that, too, on the Potomac. Yeah. Where you're lined up, you know, you're the second boat in line going down a bank and then the third boat veers off and goes straight to these docks and then you talk to them later and they end up, you know, picking two or three up off those docks. So like being third in line, wasn't a bad thing because it, you know, forced you out into somewhere else that maybe you wouldn't have otherwise fished. And so just kind of rolling with whatever, whatever it gives you. I, and without a doubt, and I've always told people that, you know, I've always said, if you have a comfort zone on the Potomac river, you're wrong. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because, that's gotten me in trouble thinking that mm -hmm. like, Oh, I know mm -hmm. I've got fish, you know? And, right. And sometimes that's what, like, exactly. It's what it takes is like, you find someone in your spot and you're like, all right, what do I do? I'm here. Mm -hmm. Let's do, mm -hmm. let's do that plan B, C, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and listen to the fish, you know, right. they didn't want anything moving on Sunday where on Saturday I was able to catch a couple moving. Um, hmm. it was a very, very finessey kind of bite. Um, Sunday had to, I, I, so Saturday I was spun out and you know, when you spin out, it's just like some days, you know, casting accurately just comes so much easier than it does other days. And you're like, what, what was it today that, you know, and Saturday I couldn't cast worth a darn, you know, it's like five feet away from my target. It's mm -hmm. just not like me. You know, I was like, it, I practice this stuff, like do better, you know? And then Sunday I couldn't do anything wrong. I mean, I'm telling you, Dude, when it's your time, my God, it is, it is your yeah. time. <laughs> You're right. And, uh, and, and Sunday just played out and it was fun. You know, it was cool. I really didn't like have any pressure on myself. Um, the most pressure that I got Sunday is it was a very, very specific area. I'm going to say 20 yards square and six or seven key pieces of wood. And I'd just go down the line, bing, 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 you know, and on my way back, uh, you know, one of the other, uh, you know, objects I was casting towards would, would ha automatically have another fish in there and they were all good fish. Hmm. Um, I never caught any really small fish. That was the best part. Um, hmm. and, uh, man, it was just, it was one of those days. It was, it was really fun. I wanted to ask you, you talked earlier too about the when when it doesn't go right or you're not getting bit, like what is your in your mind, what is your go-to or what do you what do you process to say this this is what I need to do next? You know, I I got this thing, you know, I just kind of stop and I breathe and I think because that 
and and I don't think that I speak for just myself when I say that sometimes fishermen we overcomplicate things mm-hmm. way too much. Yeah. Oh yeah. And and I've had that after action report after a tournament and going, oh, you dummy. You know, you just made it you, you thought way too much about it. Mm-hmm. A lot of times it's a lot more simple than than so my thing now is to just stop, put everything down, turn the motor off, don't look at the screen and just go, what am I what am I missing here? All right, so I've went through colors. I've, you know, um, and I, you know, Gerald Swindle said it one time, and I, I just like resonate with it. You know, you go on Tackle Warehouse or any rebate websites, and they have got seventy-two different flavors of Senko mm-hmm. or something like that. And you're like, mm-hmm. and Gerald Swindle said, if I can't catch them on black and blue, green pumpkin, That's or white, right. those fish are way too smart for me, and I don't want to catch them. Yeah, and that clicked with me. I was like, you're right, because there is ways to like really get out of and and not saying in certain areas there's that certain color that does better than others um but i think for the most part i've simplified uh, my selection um and and that seems to be like really kind of the key is is you know packing a little bit smaller to give yourself your brain a little escape from trying to think Mm -hmm. of craziness you know maybe they want this Mm -hmm random sparkle color whatever you know it's like no you're, you're not doing something right you're in the wrong area you know so mm-hmm. i think to answer your question is just to really like not overcomplicate things and, mm-hmm. and just try the next most simplistic option mm-hmm. um because you know you're bound to run into um you know certain things now at a santee cooper event you've got environmental factors that play in too um mm where an area i was fishing all pre-fishing time which was two days before the event was really really good and then come tournament day i noticed something that water level kept dropping and kept dropping and kept Mm -hmm. dropping and it caught up with me sunday and i was like oh man Mm -hmm. i don't really have a plan b from here you know stuff Mm -hmm. i was catching fish in on friday is now out of water Mm -hmm. what do i do yeah we, we, I, uh, I had an interview with Nolan Miner who fished that thing. And he, and that's so interesting to think about like how the lakes drain. Like I've never actually fished Cooper, but the idea of like the one lake draining into the other, and you, you have to think about that almost like a tide, so to speak, where that water is leaving you and you have to like get ahead of that. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it, it really caught me kind of with my pants down on that Sunday because I went back and I was like, what is this place? You yeah. know, and it drained down quick, and, you know, so maybe it's not always you, you know, what else is going on? Is there, right. you know, are you paying attention? Where was that water? You know, mm-hmm. it's kind of funny. I was fishing the Susquehanna river years ago and there was an old timer there and he pulled his boat out of the water and, uh, he put a rock down, you know, a good sized stone on the water level of the ramp. And he said, yeah, I said, what are you doing? And he goes, Oh, I'm coming back tomorrow morning. I want to see where the water's at from that stone that he put on the ramp. And That's I was cool. like, Man, That's here I awesome. am on the uh, on the the GIS website or whatever, you know, looking at water data and on every app yeah. that I've got. And like, this old timer just keeping it simple. He's like, "Man, we'll be here tomorrow. I'll figure out it's up or down from a rock." That's and right. I was like, brilliant. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like once again we over we over uh, complicate right. things. You know, the ramp, uh, the the rock at the ramp trick. What a brilliant idea! I never even right. thought about that. So that was just kind of a cool little tip, you know that. Yeah. And then what he did, he took that rock and moved it back up about three foot. He yeah, said, oh, right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> After he launched, he was like, I'll mess with that young guy that was asking me. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I love your, sim- you, you're, you're looking at about, about simplifying a complex problem to keep it straight mm-hmm. in your head. And, and with, with that said, what was, what was your approach bait wise day one versus day two? I mean, what adjustments did you make going from, from day one to day two? Um, well, I, I will tell you. Uh, I always try and start with like the easy bait, something moving, you know, like on the Potomac river, a jackhammer, a, or a, any sort of chatter bait, you know, I, Crash I like baits to, 101. <laughs> yep. Um, I like to now ask me in another week or so, once his water temperature comes up and we really start getting some grass, I like burning a speed worm. It's one of my favorite mm-hmm. ways to target fish. Cause I feel like they really react to it. Uh, we just not there yet. Um, or like a lipless crankbait right now. And I use a lipless crankbait for two reasons. I'll purposely try and get that thing lodged in the something on the bottom so I can 
bring some back home if you know what i mean and see what i'm working with because mm -hmm. that's my my graph doesn't tell me if that's newly emergent grass or old stuff from last year and only one way to find out is drag a couple of treble hooks and bring some home to the boat and so that's what i'm looking for if i can bring something green back this time of year it it gives me reason to continue casting in that area if it's yeah. that slimy brown nastiness move on I don't yeah, want to don't, it, don't, don't be don't. telling too many people about lipless baits right now. I want everyone throwing chatter baits. Yeah, in. well, I, I it, mean, my goodness. Yeah, you know, and 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 there's so many. You know, everyone thinks with a lipless crankbait that the only retrieve is, you know, burning it or whatever. You know, I, and I'm not going to say much more. But, <laughs> the, but you yeah, can, if you guys, you yeah. can move them <laughs> differently. But yeah, if you guys want to know about those tips, I have a video on that because that's where I won all my money was, was fishing lipless. I mean, it's crazy because like there's so many baits to choose from. And I bet maybe the lipless isn't as good as I think mentally, but there's so many to pick from. It's hard, like you said, to simplify that you can't throw mm -hmm. a swim bait, a lipless, a, a chatter bait, a spinner bait, and a swim jig all at the same time. You have to literally pick something. And sure. maybe they're all equal, but it's like how much of it is then confidence versus what's the best. And then like, you could spin yourself out so easily trying to throw everything versus saying like, I'm just going to lock a couple of these rods and, and that's it. We're good. Yeah. No it, it, truth be told. So I like finesse fishing and I don't know what it is. Um, there's a, there's an angler, Jed Plunker, um, Great angler. that I would put on the top of my list when it comes to finesse um, angling. And Jed's taught me a lot over the years, and and I give credit where it's due. I think that guy's just, I put him on a whole nother pedestal. Um, He's good. And and I found out that in the in the DMV in the Mid Atlantic region, if I I'm going to find out where Jed's fishing, and I'm going to fish against him because I want to see how I meet up with you know with Jed, and and I'm great friends with Jed. Uh, we've we've fished. Uh, Kentucky Lake together stayed in the same house and he's just as good of a guy off the water as he is in the water but um I've you know he's he's told me you know countless times on on his what his thinking thought process everything is when it goes to that and I, you know you're, you're 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 looking for more minute changes so I I'd like to consider myself a decent you know finesse angler and I like catching him um Okay, but I, I want to pick your brain. Yeah, I want to yeah. pick your brain about that too, because we are seeing this weird change right now in fishing, where we had a, a Japanese angler finish. I think it was second or third at 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 Lake uh, Lake Chickamauga. We had a Japanese angler win at the James. Finesse fishing is becoming more and more prevalent. But why is it? Do you think there's this? I don't know. This people are holding back from picking up what they call the fairy wand. Cause so many times I see on the Potomac river, even when I fish it, no one will be caught dead with a spinning rod, but yeah. it is so lethal. Is it just like a masculine thing that people don't want to accept that? Like this is effective. You know, I, honestly, I, I think people, like you said, have their confidence ways of catching fish. Um, there, there is not a better bite. in in my eyes than a river smallmouth on a spinner bait it, for me that's right up there with winning the lottery like when you get those days when they're firing off on a on a on a spinner mm -hmm. bait i don't know what it is mm -hmm. it's like lightning going through the rod mm -hmm. and uh and i love it but those days don't always happen so i think versatility is the big thing mm -hmm. it's like being able to put down that that bait caster and effectively spin a f you know a finesse combo and when I talk about finesse, um, really kind of slowing down and 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 downsizing weights, um, and, and you can finesse bigger stuff too. That's the other thing. Mm -hmm. When I say finesse, it, it doesn't mean I, I don't love throwing a Ned rig. I've got different. I I, I love a shaky head uh, <laughs> more than most. Um, uh, so finesse is relative. Yeah. It is. It's relative. But, uh, you know, I think being able to be versatile enough to know what the fish really want um, is is kind of, you know, mm -hmm. more powerful than anything. And, and I, I'm with you. There's a lot of people I know. I've got friends that are like, I won't touch one. I don't, I don't want mm -hmm. a spinning rod. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, I will. <laughs> and there's no shame to my game with it. Like, I Especially, think yeah. 
like an angler of your caliber, like if you want to be able to fish across this nation, you got to know. I, I just don't see how you could go your whole career without being familiar with a spinning rod. There's so many good sticks around here that I feel like could be that much better if they would just spend a day with a spinning rod in their hands and learning that. Yeah. You know, and that very well could be the case too. But like I said, confidence is key. And if someone, you know, they'd rather make a hundred casts to my 10 and think mm -hmm. that they're covering more mm -hmm. water and in their head, that's what makes the most sense and is bringing them success. I have a hard time mm -hmm. knocking that because um, that's, that's the cool part as anglers. There's, we're like thumbprints, man. There's no two alike, you True. know, everybody's got their, their own little characteristics and, and, and thought process. And, and I'm just as guilty of, of those guys of not being able to put the, the finesse rod down and pick up a moving bait again, you know, until it's almost too late. So. I think it's kind of like too, I heard Hank Parker down at the classic uh, expo talk about, he was talking about crankbaits and how different depths. And he said, he, he looks at it like a tool and you need a certain tool to do a certain job. And now he was explaining depths, but the same thing applies to, our gear and our rods is, you know, if we want to catch fish, that's our goal. Each one is a different tool. And like, you're, you're exactly right. Like you're saying the fish will tell you what they want, how they want it. So we've got to be able to adjust and adapt to, to the way they're eating or not eating and use those different tools. And, and you're right. Mm -hmm. it, it, and listen to you too, the simplicity, we're our own worst enemy when it comes right down to we it are. of overthinking it or, or, just trying to pet, beat that uh, square peg in a round hole type thing. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's, it's much easier to keep things simplistic on mm -hmm. a non tournament day, but sometimes during mm -hmm. a tournament right. day, that is the remembering to drink water. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, very, it, it's like sustenance. Your body requires it. Yeah. Right? You've lost all common brain cell functionality to, remember to drink water you know and then you yeah. feel like hell the next day well um, even jason christie on the classic you know he, you hear him say like you know i'm just gonna i'm going out just like like you're saying you're talking about having fun yeah it's like i'm just gonna go fish today you know race everything else that i that i've done i'm just gonna fish and again there's something to be said about that nolan talked about that also where there's certain times like you're saying when you're spinning out just to say you know what I, i'm just gonna have fun and in, whereas in practice if you're out there practicing, it's not tournament day, you're going to change to catch fish. But yeah. something about a tournament and that pressure mm -hmm. makes us want to just keep grinding when, when maybe that's the wrong thing to do. So th this is interesting. Don't yeah, and you, you, guys are, you guys have all fish tournaments. Um, that I don't know what happens to the clock yeah. on tournament day, yeah. uh, but it feels like four hours versus your right. typical eight-hour day, whereas on a practice day, it's like, Mm -hmm. You feel like you have a 12 hour day or a fun fishing day. You know, you're mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, I still have four hours. And then on right. tournament day, you look down, it's eight o'clock. Okay. And then you, you feel like you catch a couple of fish and you look down and it's 1230 and you're like 1230. Where did mm -hmm. the, you know? So time management is also one of the things that I've really been focusing on too. Is really I crack up just listening to you say that because at 830, let's see, uh, let me finish my last cup of coffee here yeah. before I go out here and win this tournament. And I'm also thinking too, these other guys, when they hear this, they're going to be like, what the heck? We just got smoked. And yep. this dude didn't even fish the entire time. Like, yeah. he's that uh, good. Uh, no, man. When it's when it's That's your awesome. time, it's your time. Um, I right. historically, um, as far as the KBF trail goes, I have not done well on not done bad, but I've just historically had better Sundays than I have Saturdays. I won a trail two years ago on a Sunday. Last year, I placed top. I don't know, top ten, seventh place, I think on sunday and then this year i wanted to get on a sunday so i don't and maybe sunday's just my day i need to fish more tournaments but um and, and i couldn't tell you why um i i you know i've looked at myself in the mirror and gone what is it about saturday that doesn't click for you like a sunday but maybe it's just that need another do you day like multi-day events more than I a do. single day i yeah. love them um, the cool part about kbf is that each day is treated differently so Trail one's a completely separate entity from trail two mm -hmm. on Sunday. Um, but I also like, you know, the Hobie BOS series when they do the two day event. You, you know, it's not won or lost in a single day. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, you can be sitting at top 20 going from a Saturday and really have a shot to make a good run. 
maybe not win it on Sunday, but really make up some good effort, you know, and, and when points are on the line, if you can leave Sunday better off than you left Saturday, that's, that's all the difference in the world. Even if it's three or four points, you know, it doesn't take much to, to really kind of change the tide on that. So, um, you know, and, and you were talking about it too. I think this year, my motto and my mantra is just trying to be like, go out and have more fun on tournament days. Mm -hmm. Like, because at the end of the day, as much as I love this, it's not, it's not what I do for a living. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's my hobby. Um, and, and I want to keep it that way. And, and, you know, I'm like, I see so many people that, that just like get so worked up over something mm -hmm. that it's fishing. Nothing's guaranteed. It's almost like they're losing fun of the sport. And I'm like, mm -hmm. man, I can't let this happen to me. You mm -hmm. know, I'm, I'm so competitive, but in the same mm -hmm. aspect, like I love seeing others succeed. Um, I want my friends to do well. I want completely you know if we could all win it would be a perfect in my world because it'd probably be one hell of an after party and we drink way too much beer or something right. but um no it's it's just as fun and that's why i'm kind of like backing off from the makbf thing this year and competing is i want to see some of my my friends down there do well and not that that me fishing it is going to prevent them from doing well uh, but I want to see it through the non-tournament lens. I want to be able to go follow them with my camera, find the guy that's like on them, mm -hmm. and go, you know, send him some good pictures, some some high quality, high res pictures that he can, you know, put up on Facebook, put on an Instagram. You know, it might get him a follower, or might get him a a sponsor, or you know, might just be something, you know, they didn't leave the tournament with a fish on the board, but they got a really awesome picture and like a back cast. And it's like that for me this year, like I want to help other people, you know, I, cool. that's, that's my focus and I want to have fun and I'm going to have fun doing that. So, and it's, it's that, that for me is fun. It's connecting the dots and, and uh, you know, try to be less selfish when it comes to a also my family time it's five more events that i'm not gonna have to worry about pre-fishing i can be home uh, now before i go any further i will still have a rod or two with me because i can't go somewhere without catching a fish or two uh, but i just won't be tournament fishing so it, it'll be fun i'm looking forward to it. what got you into photography ah that's tough <laughs> i don't i don't know um, I am an avid archery hunter and outdoorsman, conservationist. Uh, I was always the kid that like, I'd see like an eagle up in a tree, you know, and I'd be like, you know, mouth hanging wide open. Mm -hmm. And, and I was, I don't know, it's like, as I get older, like, you know, yeah, I've become less of like you know wanting to kill something it's just like being out in in a tree and just watching like you know a red fox run by or something like that and i'd go home and i'd tell my wife I'm like look this awesome big fox came running by and it was barking up and then all of a sudden you know the other one that it was barking with came running through That's so and cool. they sat 20 feet from my tree stand and i had this like old iphone that you could barely tell is that a squirrel or a fox and i was <laughs> like, like <laughs> maybe maybe i'll just buy a camera and it's kind of shifted my whole thing now i don't i don't use it as enough as i probably would like to um but that kind of comes with the territory and i plan on changing that this year too um is making sure i you know the hardest thing to do with a camera is make sure it like you've got to live with it because rare wildlife moments mm -hmm. you can't force them they just happen mm -hmm. and they seem to happen a lot more when you don't have your camera with them so mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to make sure I have it more. Mm -hmm. And I, I love the wildlife photography stuff. I don't think, you know, it, it, it gives someone the ability that isn't into the outdoors to have a view into either my life or someone else's mm -hmm. life that, you know, you can photograph people all you want. You know, we see people every day. I don't need to, shoot, you know, that's mm -hmm. not, um, I like the wildlife stuff stuff that 90% of the people won't see, you know, and it, through, through my lens and, and I use it 
truth be told for like my own little like life memory book someday i hope to you know trying to keep track of time dates stuff like that with these pictures so that mm -hmm. that's cool look back later on in life you know and maybe not don't have the physical ability to go as hard as i do now to, to mm -hmm. kind of look back and be like that was awesome so <laughs> you're gonna be like a marty stauffer but no i like yeah. i like what you're doing too because it is um you can kind of capture that and you bring it back uh you know for others to see like you're saying and you can, especially even video like you can relive that it's cool to see it the first time or experience it but then when you get the you know see it again it just kind of brings back all those emotions that we can all relate to so that's pretty cool yeah you know and I, it, i'm far from professional um mm -hmm. I, it's a, it's a de definitely a learning curve and, and that for me is just another just a, a skill that i enjoy learning and the big key too like you were saying I, and i also with hunting i've videoed and i've done kind of sort of same thing but you're, you're like you're saying you're in a in an environment where you're going to see so many things that a lot of people like you're saying will never see you know, so that, that is pretty cool. Yeah, my biggest regret is I went out uh, mule deer hunting in Boundary County, Idaho, um, up in the mountains, and I didn't have a camera. And mm. I was just like, we came across moose, you know, fresh wolf kills, mm -hmm. stuff that, you know, you don't see out here on the mm -hmm. East Coast. And it was just like, man, all right, buying a camera. Sorry. Right. Sorry. What camera I are you running? um i have the d500 nikon okay nikon boy. um <laughs> uh, you know i didn't know a whole lot about cameras going in but i knew that uh at the time when i bought my d500 for a crop sensor i think it was the fastest shutter speed so it's a really you know for bird yeah. for birding and and stuff like that which i enjoy i like you know waterfowl stuff like that uh birds of prey having a quick uh you know sensor and shutter is is important so um that that's what kind of pushed me that way and just like anything in life i was like all right i'm gonna go all in because i knew if i bought something that was like eh, mm -hmm. i'd be upgrading again and then you're back to like you know it's like the kayak thing you know mm -hmm. i started with something cheap and then i was like well i got it this isn't doing it i got it. you know so mm -hmm. I just went with something good from the get go and I, I love it. I think it's, I think it's a great camera. Um, and I've got, you know, a buddy of mine who does more professional work than me and he bounces through cameras like, uh, you know, but, but he's got the, the ability and the skill to differentiate what makes a camera good and, you know, not so good where for me, I'm just so green with it that, um, when I get a good picture, I like, woo, you know, it's my thing. So. So I had a question too. Uh, I saw, you know, where, where you mentioned also fishing up there to the Susquehanna. So you got a chance to fish with Mike Iconelli. Um, and just talk maybe a little bit about the Susquehanna River and uh, your experience fishing that water. I love the Susquehanna. Um, the Susquehanna is incredible, incredible body of water. Um, I, you know, I hate to say it on, on a podcast, but the first time I went up there, I was like, Forget Maybe about it. Ever. When 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 my time on earth comes to an end, mm -hmm. like take some of me and put it in this thing because mm -hmm. uh, you know, like knock me dead. This that, that place is incredible. It's I get so lost in just looking at the views. And like yeah, everything else. Uh, there there's something about that place that provides me a ton of peace and tranquility, mm -hmm. and it also fits the bill because some of the best smallmouth fishing in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> uh, I. You know, I've been fishing the Susky mm, probably about six years now. Um, and some years are better than others for me. Um, I I don't consider myself to be like one of the top Susquehanna anglers. Um, there's people, you know, Jedediah Plunker, uh, Russell Johnson, as far as the kayak side goes, um, mm -hmm. Bill Dubrow, uh, Jay Karshman, Trey Leach. Those guys, I mean, they're they're just you know time on the water is everything and mm -hmm. just kind of my location uh, but those are guys that i really look up to obviously jeff little uh, probably knows the susquehanna better than most as well i think he's a he's a phenomenal river angler mm -hmm. um and and i always use it as a as a learning opportunity i've always told people you learn the most from a bad day of fishing than you do from the good day of fishing amen you just got to be smart enough to 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 not hang your head low enough to not pick up on those things you know
Mm-hmm. And and that's moving forward. That's and that's what I do. You know, is, is they they've always been the biggest learning um, events. And I've I've been handed my few days of learning events on the Susquehanna too. And uh, hopefully those things that I've I've learned along the way kind of play into this year. That's mm-hmm. freaking awesome. Um, a couple couple more questions before we let you go. I don't keep you here sure. all night. Um, yeah. How do you approach? Do you approach a lake? and a river the same way. I, I really, a couple of things that really keyed to me was when, how methodical you are on an area, which I feel like if you're not used to fishing grass and tidal or maybe an Okeechobee, you have this weird, like, I'm going to blast 50 different pockets. I'm going to run spots, almost like a blueback lake. But it, it's almost, it feels like polar opposite when you grow up tidal or grass fisheries compared to like, you know, a Carolina style. Is that something that you just specifically do for for rivers and grass, or is that your your lifestyle no matter where you fish? Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting you say that. I, I don't even know if I've answered that question for myself. Um, I I do a lot more map study work on a lake than I will a river. Um, I'll try and get into the uh, you know imagery side of things too, topography things like that. Um. I think like lakes and reservoirs are different. Um, and that being said is, you know, a lot of lakes like Marion um, and Moultrie in my eyes are two very different bodies of water, um, the way they set up for Santee Cooper. Um, and I think certain things, you know, and I, I, Nolan Miner, I mean, just you listen to that guy talking, you're like both of the Miner brothers, mm-hmm. Ewing. Uh, Nolan, mm-hmm. they're as good as it gets. And just listening to them talk, you're like, them boys just get it. You know, mm-hmm. like, yeah. Uh, we were at the BOS event down there and uh, at the awards ceremony. You know, I, I forget Nolan fished fifth or sixth, or I could be wrong with that. Don't quote sixth, me. Yeah. yeah. Six or seven. And he's talking about his bed fishing approach. And I was just like, I was blown away. I was like, man, there's something with those brothers that mm-hmm. is special. And and I'm going to say it, watch out world. Um, those two are going somewhere mm-hmm. and you can tell they're young. They're a lot younger mm-hmm. than me. Um, and, and they just, they get it. They think about the things that most people don't. Mm-hmm. And they, they got that early on. Um, but listening to Nolan talk about bed fishing down there for the, probably five or six minutes. It blew my knowledge of bed fishing out of the water. Wow. Um, I just don't do a whole lot of bed fishing because it's almost, it's really intimidating. I've tried, you know, and you're like, it's frustrating too and requires an immense amount of patience. Um, And time. I mean, unless you're living in Florida where the spawn takes place over six months and not two weeks, right. you got to think about how many seasons has Nolan been practicing bed fishing where, for where he lives. I mean, it, right. again, like it's not like Florida where he gets a huge window each year, which means he's been doing it for a long time and he's right. young, which is insane. Now, I think mm-hmm. those, those guys are quick learners. Um, you know, love fishing with them. I think, uh, just think they're good for the sport all the way around. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I, and I learned some stuff too, but, you know, kind of going back to your question about how I approach a lake, it, it, there's so many different variables that go into it. What time of year is it? You know, I love deep cranking, deep cranking. I'm talking, you know, 6XD and above, uh, Norman D22s, um, stuff that, you know, uh, that one of my favorite bites too is, is a deep cranking bite, you know, or it's not, you don't actually feel like a strike. It's just like more pressure on your rod. Cause you know, on a glass rod, mm-hmm. it almost sets the hook for you. Um, and then you, you know, it's already doubled over cause you're dragging this monstrous, you know, deep diving crankbait that's dredging. Um, boy. no, we lost him for a second, but no, that that's freaking, yeah. I don't, I don't know, Jared, like to me, it's just interesting compared, um, when you compare lakes and rivers in the different styles, because one thing that really helped me was learning to sit and be patient and learning when to execute on that. You know, I always read books that you always have to do a milk run and always have to do a milk run. And it mm-hmm. wasn't until I, I decided like, I'm not leaving a Creek all day. It's mm-hmm. when light bulb went off. Like sometimes you just have to sit and milk an area. And, and it's mm-hmm. so crazy. Then I look at all these really good river rats and a lot of them have that ability to when it, ha- when it's time, 
they can lock and not move. Mm -hmm. And then they're the ones that always cash checks. And it's such a weird learning curve for me as an angler when I learned like there is a time when you have to anchor or spot lock and just be like, mm. I'm not moving from this spot. But unless you fish grass or rivers, I feel like you don't get the education that if you fish a Lake mm -hmm. Anna, a Gaston or Smith. But oh, I think we got him back here now. Alex, you there? It's like the guy too, you said that, you know, or the times and situations where the, the big motor's not running. And so you've got to make the most with what you got and you can't make that long run. So you're just kind of trolling in an area and you're staying put. Whereas before, like if, if you had the big motor and you're not getting bit, you're going to say, we got to go. You pick right. up and go, whereas you don't have it. So now you got to sit and you sit there and soak that jig mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you get bit. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you hear those stories and it is so true. And again, that's so hard because our mind gets working on us. Do you sit or do you stay? But to your point, I still, I do agree with that. There are fish in your given area and they may not be the right fish to win, but there's fish in there and you just got to figure them out and find them. Absolutely. You know, I, one of the tournaments last year, first tournament of the year was up at Lake Marburg in Pennsylvania. And I, I really struggled on practice. I mean, I went up there and blanked out on practice the, the week before, um, went back, uh, the Friday before the event. And I had a couple hours in that pre-vision window to go out and I picked a spot, parked on it, caught one. And I said, well, here's where I'm going tomorrow, you know, and. <laughs> And I did. I didn't move out of a cove. I've actually got a really cool screenshot from my graph that it, uh, you know, this whole cove looks like a zebra from the plot behind me. <laughs> um, and I, and I sat there and I didn't get bit a lot. Uh, it was only, you know, maybe seven or eight bites throughout the day, but they were good bites. So, um, you know, that's, and, and I didn't feel confident leaving that spot, you know, the, the whole time I'm like, uh, this is painful. I've looked at, you know, and the zebra stripes for me from going one side of a cove to another, just to have different scenery. Cause I really didn't think it mattered, you know, in, it was a small cove. So in relation to it, I don't think they cared where it came from or, you know, influences like that, but I've learned to uh, turn the motor off and really thoroughly. Sometimes it bites you in the butt though, is sitting mm -hmm. there isn't right. something sitting too long, you know, it's that buffer. Um, I think instinct is your best friend. Mm -hmm. You know, generally your first instinct, pretty good instinct. It's when you start going, well, I don't know. You know, uh, yes. And that's, I think that's a bit of advice for me too, is like, you know, listen to that initial instinct. When you start getting into that, you know, like hearing it from both sides in your head, generally that your instinctive, uh, your first instinct was, was the one you should, pro should have probably went with from mm -hmm. the get go. So, so three questions we try to ask all, all of our, uh, all of our new guests, of the show is number one, what are some hopes and dreams that you have for this year? But after you won the tournament, I don't know what you could do except not wake up till lunchtime and then still crack the victory. Yeah, that was, uh, that was, that was pretty cool. Two, I don't know. what is your, what is your favorite place around here that people don't think about the DMV that is, is a good area for kids to start fishing? Um, that is maybe, may, maybe a little place that people don't think about that. That's not going to get too many people mad at you. And the last one is what's something that you think younger anglers could do to get better. Ooh, that's good. Um, uh, well, you know, th there's so many like, you know, different things that I, I think of when I, when those questions, those questions are actually really tough. They're not simple questions because mm -hmm. there's such, there's, you know, when you're talking about, you know, raising uh, or, or a kid to go out and fish. My son has only been out fishing a handful of times. Um, and I want him to, con you know, think it's fun. I want it to be his idea. If he chooses not to fish, I could care less. I, of course, I want him to fish. Um, but when we do go out, there's a pond right up the road from me. And it is chop full of like bluegill. I would, I would suggest any local county park pond mm -hmm. and go out there, you know, back to the basics, a sinker mm -hmm. uh, or a piece of split shot, a small hook and a bobber and get kids out there and get them catching mm -hmm. because it's not there. You're not teaching them the instinct part. You're just trying to have them enjoy a fun day to fish out on the mm -hmm. water. So he gets going and catching a bunch of fish. And I always stop him before he asks me to go home. 
I want him to say, Dad, I'll just one more, just one more, because I mm-hmm. want to leave that fire in him. But I, I don't bring him right back out the next day. I just don't think his head's there. I don't think his heart's there. And I want it to be his idea. Um, so the DMV is full of those areas. Um, I would steer clear of your your bigger, more populated areas, you know, small county parks. Um, most counties have handbooks. Um online that tell you about you know public fishing opportunities and i would say start there um and that's for the junior kids now going into your question kind of more so related to like the younger anglers uh a piece of advice is time on the water trumps everything you know i see a lot of like and and success isn't always instantaneous um it's okay to get beat uh, it's okay. You know, it's still okay for me to get beat. I I'm good with it. Um, stay humble and, and help others, you know, um, that's, that's, you know, kind of the main thing of this, uh, quit putting all the YouTube videos out, giving away everybody spots, you know, <laughs> it's really tough, saturated market with YouTube right now. And there's a there's a proper way of doing it and there's an improper way of doing it. I know that's um, beating a dead horse there. Uh, I love the channel of YouTube. I think it's great, but uh, I've certainly seen it used. I think it could be detrimental to certain areas. Um, and, and then as far as for me, you know, my goal for this year is to try and promote as many other people other than myself and, and you know, kind of go down the road of being a mentor for that avenue and and, you know, helping someone, trying to be like, you know, if someone says my name, I want it in good taste. And, you know, like, hey, that guy, that guy's awesome. You know, he helped me put my kayak on the back of the truck or, you know, mm-hmm. help help someone, help me in some sort of capacity this year. Um, and, and realistically, I hope people think I'm a better person than they think I am an angler. Um, that's mm-hmm. not my legacy. Um, uh, I was put on this earth to give back. Um, and, and that's what I plan on doing this year is trying to, to give back in some way, shape or form. So that's really awesome. Um, uh, real quick too, I was thinking before when you're talking about a you know, guy moving in, just some, maybe two, just talk a little bit, cause I think this is important because one thing we always talk about too, on this show is we're, there's so many different ways to fish and catch fish and there's no wrong way to do it. There's no right way to do it. Just it's each to their own. Uh, but with that said, kind of like maybe talk a little bit about, you know, the kayak versus the boater um, relationship and just kind of a, I don't know, maybe mutual respect. Cause that's how I see it. I think it's a mutual respect. Uh, it doesn't matter how you're on the water fishing as long as you're on the water fishing, but what, what kind of advice would you give maybe to the boaters and or kayakers on how we could both use this same resource together? same time that's a that's an interesting topic you know um fishing i fishing the potomac river a lot you know just we have a really really diverse population of just anglers in general um because we are the dmv and the dmv brings in people from all different walks of life and puts us Mm -hmm. all in the same body of water um i don't have it you know I would tell the boaters the same thing that I would tell the kayakers. Be patient. Right. None of this is worth arguing over. None of it's Mm -hmm. worth fighting over. Well, some of it is. Uh, But if everyone's patient, (laughs) maybe it's not. It'll work out. Um, You know, it it trips my trigger and it still happens. And I've, I've beat the horse dead, a kayak angler setting up in front of a ramp, a boat ramp Mm -hmm. to stage their gear is not, it, it gives us, you know, it gives us kind of mm-hmm. a bad rap. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that being said, not every, you know, not all boaters are created the same, mm-hmm. just like kayakers, you know, and we'll get there. Mm-hmm. And and there's ways of approaching a problem, whether it be on the water or at the ramp. And kindness goes, you know, it's really hard when you kill someone with kindness, man. Mm-hmm. It's hard to get like a, a negative response from Very them. Point. And, and just patience. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's one of those things. It's just like driving in the DMV. Why are people driving like they're 20 minutes late? Wake up 20 minutes earlier and you wouldn't have to drive like you're 20 minutes late. You know, right. 
if if I know that I'm going to go to a congested area and I got to be there, get ready at a certain time, I just get there a little earlier, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. I, and I hate rushing, setting up my kayak because I'm likely to forget something. Or, mm-hmm. um, but you know, for the most part, uh, look, I, I, I've, I've fished the beach at Aquia with 50 boats, and I fished mm-hmm. uh, the uh, Susquehanna Flats out in the Upper Chesapeake Bay with over a hundred boats from the wow. Ike tournament while I was out in my kayak. And I never wow. had a single problem the entire time. Um, uh, most, most of the, the comments to me was, what are you doing out here this far? Do you have, a, you know, are you crazy? And I said, no, I got a motor. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've like run into Travis Manson out there and you know, just every, everybody, you know, community whole fishing is that, you know, mm-hmm. um, it's, it's a bumper boat style of fishing. Um, I think it's different on the Potomac. It's expected. Yes. Um, Thank you for touching on that. Cause yeah. uh, Jared, I remember when I talked to, to the high school anglers a couple years back, it's like mm-hmm. etiquette on the Potomac is not like the etiquette on a lake. It's like having mm-hmm. etiquette in New York city or Jersey compared right. to, to Mayberry. It, it just, it, right. I don't, I don't know how to explain it besides that. It is right. it's just different, mm-hmm. but you still have to be respectful, but understand right. it's different. Yeah. Right. You know, um, I know there's kayak anglers that, you know, just they badmouth boats. I fortunately for me is I've done both. So I get everybody, I get kind of like the frustrations that come from both sides. Um and and a lot of people say they've had bad experiences with boaters. Um I, I've had a handful, um, but nothing, nothing mm-hmm. terrible. Nobody tried, you know, sinking me or this and that. Mm-hmm. I, you know we've had disagreements on kind of, you know, areas and things along that. And, mm-hmm. uh, but, it, you know, as far as it goes for a teaching point, like I said, patience, mm-hmm. um, that's good. Kindness. You know, you can, you're going to win a lot. You're going to lure a lot more bees in with honey than your vinegar. So, right. Um, good that's, advice. that's just my little tidbit mm-hmm. on it. And like I said, I, I still fish from a boat occasionally. So, uh, I'm not one way or the other. I just, I, I'd like, I like, I like the serenity of the kayak fishing. Um, I think it adds a few different uh, challenges. Um, and, you know, it's, it's my little therapy, you know, I like it. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I, you know it's, it's interesting. Uh, no, it's good. You got a good perspective on things and, you know, I've really enjoyed listening to you. You've got, Good, good head on your shoulders, and you're also a good ambassador for the sport. So that was it's really good to let, hear you tell your stories. Yeah, yeah, that's that's my uh, that's my plan is to uh, leave the sport better than I found it, and uh, won't stop trying. Amen, a- Alex. Th- thank you so much for for giving us an hour of your time tonight. Um, we really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, is there any sponsors that you'd like to mention? Yeah, Delaware Paddle Sports in Lewis, Delaware. Um, they're they're a one stop shop. Um, multiple brands of kayak, fishing related accessories, kayaks. Uh, you know, whitewater recreational stand up paddle boards. There's there's nothing that they don't carry, and if they don't carry it, they will do their best to get it in. Um, always tax free because they're in Delaware. Um, so if you make the trip up there, you can save you a little money, um, skipping on it or, you know, avoiding the tax rate and, uh, I rod fishing, um, I rod is it's, you know, historically been kind of a St. Croix guy until I put a, uh, a Genesis three model in my hand. And, um, I've, I don't have enough good things to say about them. And I don't want to be the guy that says, Oh, shameless plug for this. Um, because I can't, you know, tell you how nice they are until you try one. So something cool that I'm going to be doing this year at our events is I'm going to have a few rods that I'm going to send out with anglers if they want to try them hmm. and they can put them in their hands and see what it feels like. You know, they can either say, Hey, that's great. I want to get one or they can go, eh, you know, I like the way the feel of my lose rod or something. Yeah, that's fine. Mm. Um, so they're going to be up for grabs on, you know, taking a few demos out and, that's and fishing cool. them. And that's we have idea. a contingency program with them as well at MAKBF. So if you're the highest placing finisher uh, and you're in the contingency program with IROD, 
it's fifty dollars in I rod cash towards a rod. Mm. If you're in the contingency and you win the event, it's a free I rod of your choosing. So it's an Very awesome cool. little contingency program we have at MAKBF, and we can't be uh, more thankful for Matt Newman allowing us to uh, uh, spread some of that love on our anglers and uh, you know kind of push the I rod thing. So. that's awesome that's freaking awesome where can everyone follow you on your your fishing and, and photography ex escapades uh instagram alex under slash fioca um and then alex fioca on facebook I, I don't i don't try and make a huge trend out of turning social media into something uh not saying that i don't want you know more people following me but I, i'd much rather you know much rather meet you in the water or in person i'm kind of old school when it comes to that you know the Social media is an awesome platform to, uh, you know, really kind of express your brand and what you put out there. But uh, a firm handshake is more important to me. I'd, I'd much rather meet you out on the water than, you know, if you find my my Instagram or Facebook amusing or interesting in some sort of way, or if I, you can use it as a, if I can use it as a vehicle to help somebody, mm -hmm. by all means. Uh, but I still use, you know, Facebook for the true essence and, and Instagram as well. I, I didn't grow up in Maryland. Um, most of my family still lives in South Dakota and some in Idaho. It's a tool that I use to post up pictures of, from my kid, my life outside of fishing. It's it's not just a fishing related page. You'll see mm -hmm. pictures of my kid, my wife, you know, things unrelated to uh, photography, things unrelated to fishing. So uh, that's that's just me and my little take on social media. Um, and it's easy keeping it small, keeping it simple um is is my little route to do it so and that's good too though i mean i think you were talking about swindle earlier i know that he's, he's real down to earth too and it's like you know it's it's and, and people we can relate to that because we all you know we have families or different things we have sure. a life like you're saying and and what i like about the things you're saying too is finding that balance between life and the things we enjoy and and keeping things in perspective so uh, you did a great job tonight and really enjoyed uh, like i say listening to uh, your insight into into your passion of fishing Sure. Well, hopefully we can do this again sometime soon. Yes, I've sir. Always. Thank you so much for yeah. Thank you so much for your time and good luck the rest of the season. And guys, uh, link in the episode description to all of his sponsors where you can follow him. Again, please like and subscribe to the channel. It helps us out with the algorithm. Uh, and we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts Thomas Aaron's and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by. Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.